legislators. Anti-gun protests continue in the wake of the shooting in Florida last week. But with me now is Dr. Richard Johnson, a lecturer in US politics at Lancaster University. Uh, Dr. Johnson, thanks for joining us this afternoon. Um, do you think the shooting in Parkland is the turning point for the campaign for more gun control in the United States? Unfortunately, I don't think that we're going to see the kind of major pieces of gun control legislation that we saw in Britain after Dunblane or Australia saw after the Port Arthur shootings in the, in the late 1990s. And that's partly because of the way that the United States Constitution is set up, that it's extremely difficult to get the kind of comprehensive uh, handgun bans that we would be uh, accustomed to either in Britain or Australia or other countries, because the United States Senate massively overrepresents uh, rural uh, areas in the United States. The 585,000 residents of Wyoming get the same number of uh, votes as the 39 million residents of California or the 20 million residents of, of Florida. And so institutionally, the system is set up in a way that favors more pro-gun areas and disempowers those areas which are much more exposed to gun violence. Um, so there may be an issue with Congress uh, in terms of being able to push uh, more gun control laws through, but just looking at um, some of the figures out of this spring 27 uh, survey, and it does seem on the face of it that most Americans would welcome tight controls on gun laws. Um, for example, 89% of Americans believe mentally ill people should be prevented from bringing guns. 84% of Americans uh, believe the gun show loophole should be closed, that is, firearms being um, purchased um, without ba background chest at test at this show. 83% believe uh, that those on the FBI no-fly list should be uh, blocked from buying guns. So there are large numbers of people who would want to see tighter control. So where does the disagreement lie? Well, I mean, in terms of even, even in areas where Democratic electorates have voted for gun control legislation, the Second Amendment can inhibit those pieces of legislation. Washington, D.C. voted for a ban on handguns. That was knocked down by the Supreme Court in 2008. The city of Chicago voted for a ban on handguns. That was knocked down by the Supreme Court in 2010. Some of these more incremental changes, which you've mentioned, were on, uh, particularly on, in terms of background checks, we might see a little bit of movement on that. But one thing I would point out is that at the end of President Obama's presidency, he made a reform which ordered the Social Security Administration to input uh, data about those who were collecting disability checks for mental illness into the gun background check system. And the Republicans in February overturned that reg regulation. President Trump signed it into law, barring the hands of not only himself, or, but or any future president from using executive action to, use, to direct the Social Security Administration to uh, address, the, uh, to use their information about mentally ill to, to address uh, that issue of the gun control story. So hands are tied wherever you look in this, in this situation, and it's difficult to see that major change is forthcoming in spite of the terrible tragedies that we've seen. Often when a shooting takes place in the United States, we on this side of the Atlantic um, at, at least talk about the National Rifle Association and their role um, in the United States. I mean, to what extent do we overplay, overstate the, the part that they play? The NRA is one of the most powerful lobbies in the United States and it's difficult to underplay their influence. The last time that we saw major pieces of gun control legislation were passed uh, in the first uh, term of Bill Clinton's presidency, the Brady Bill and the assault weapons ban. Uh, both have had bipartisan support. President, former President Ronald Reagan uh, wrote a letter expressing his support for the assault weapons ban. But Democrats suffered quite substantial losses in the midterm elections following the passage of those two pieces of legislation, in part by candidates who were funded by the, the NRA. The NRA was also very influential in Republican primary contests. And so Republican legislators who may personally agree with uh, sensible gun control legislation may feel that they risk being primaried out by a more pro-gun uh, opponent in a Republican internal primary election. And so that the, the NRA plays a significant role in policing members, Republican members of Congress in particular, to make sure that they toe the NRA's line. 
Uh, President Trump has said that uh, he wants again a uh, look at um, bump stocks. Um, he said that he would look at them after the shooting in Vegas. He's saying the same thing now. Um, is that a step in the, in the right direction? And do you think that is the start of more things to come? It was a somewhat odd announcement in some ways because uh, after the Las Vegas shooting, the um, Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms Agency, which is part of the Department of Justice, investigated whether or not they could use existing law to ban bump stocks through just regulatory changes. And they concluded that they would need new legislation in order to do that. President Trump yesterday redirected the Justice Department to uh, investigate whether or not they could uh, ban bump stocks. And so it's not clear if he's asking them to simply repeat what they did a couple of months ago, whether he's suggesting that they should change their position on this, or whether this is a signal to Congress to pass legislation. But whatever happens, if legislation isn't passed, if it happens through these regulatory changes, you can be sure that there will be challenges by the NRA and other pro-gun lobbies in the courts soon after. Dr. Johnson, thanks for your time.